We're here at the Computer History Museum. It is March 10th, 2014. My name is Doug Fairbairn, and I'm here talking with Ed Chang. Welcome, Ed. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. OK, so Ed, <coughs> as we were talking before, we'd like to go back and talk a little bit about your early family life, where you were born, where you grew up, uh, what was the influence of your parents? Did you have brothers and sisters who might have influenced? So let's uh, let's just start with that. Where where were you born, and uh, and where did you grow up? Um, I was born in Hong Kong, uh, and uh, and I grew up in Hong Kong. Uh, uh, I uh, I I was in Hong Kong until uh, after high school, and uh, uh, came over to the uh, U.S. for uh, uh, to pursue college. Okay. So what was your early family life? What kind of living situation? Did you have brothers and sisters? What, was, uh, the, wh what were your parents engaged in and that, did okay. that influence you right. significantly? Um, so a little background. Um, I, I was born in uh, the year, well, my parents left uh, Shanghai to move to Hong Kong, uh, basically as refugees, war refugees, uh, because uh, the year I, I, I was born, the uh, there was civil war going on, and uh, and and uh, the city was under, <laughs> you know, uh, in in war, uh, war conditions, and uh, and in fact the uh, the the control did change hands mm -hmm. right about that time, and you know just and and so what year did they leave Shanghai? Forty nine, and okay. I was, you, you, it, because I was born that right uh, right around that time, my mother was. Uh, Need, need to not be in a war zone, <laughs> <laughs> as you can imagine, right? So, so it was uh, that. So, um, um, Hong Kong was a rapidly growing, uh, almost like bloating type of a, a, a refugee city at the time because there was a huge influx of. Uh, uh, it's a British colony, mm -hmm. and so there was a you know it was a little bit of a, a haven from the Civil War because it's a you know. It, 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 it's it's a little bit shielded from that, right? And so a lot it attracted a lot of people. As it was chaotic, I presume. I suppose yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was too small to know. <laughs> um, so I, I suppose that it was similar situation like in Taiwan mm -hmm. at right about that time. And it's just the luck of the draw that that my parents ended up in uh, in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and because uh, of my timing. <laughs> Uh, seems like everything I hit in that uh, in 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 my growing up life, uh, we were uh, at the sort of I guess in the U.S. you call that the baby boom, right? So, the the there was a we we're at the wave front of uh, a lot of uh, uh, almost a lot of things. Uh, mm -hmm. So the the demand for resources always very <laughs> difficult, very mm -hmm. tight. Um, things like school, you know, uh, <laughs> and so forth. So. Um, However, my parents uh, 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 instilled a lot of uh, uh, value uh, to all of us. Uh, all, all we have four kids in the family, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, as far as uh, you know, academics and uh, subjects go, something you would expect from Asian parents, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was your? What did your father and mother do before they immigrated, and what did they end up doing once they got to Hong Kong? Um, so, um, my my both my parents' uh, uh, college uh, education was disrupted by uh, by events in World War II. So they were kind of uh, yeah. So uh, and and eventually, my my dad uh, had a job with Pan Am, uh, Pan American World mm -hmm. Airways, and so th it's a. Uh, it turned out to be to be uh, 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 give me a lot of exposure into uh, into uh, it's a United States you know it's a it's an American airline right mm -hmm. so I, I I got some exposure into uh, the United States through that um, and when I was small I think um, typical typically like a like a future engineer um, I was curious about mechanical things. Um, so I would, and in a, in a in a city like that, I I had a lot of opportunity to just stand around and watch how people pour concrete, for example. It's very fascinating, you know. Look at them, how they did the the rebars and so forth. 
Um, and also, <coughs> these uh, auto mechanic shops would, mm -hmm. would, would space is very tight. So people actually do work lots of pla lots of places that you would not expect kids to be. But mm -hmm. but I had the opportunity to, to observe how people take apart engines and put them back together and so forth. Uh, and eventually, I started to uh, discover uh, electrical things, <laughs> um, and I I had the chance to. to uh, Learn about and bas basically from reading reading a lot of uh, books, used books. That I happened to come across some used books on uh, on World War Two era type of uh, radio construction. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, yeah, so I went through that route and uh, started to uh, get up to 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 become quite proficient with uh, with building tube type radios. So you actually built uh, electronic radios and so forth. And d your, did your parents have any knowledge in that area, or they just encouraged you to do whatever you were doing? No, they did not have any uh, knowledge in that area. But they, they, they did not stop me. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we did not have a lot of resources, so, you know, we, but, but they, 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 they thought it was not a bad thing. And, mm -hmm. uh, um, and so at, at in high school, I became, um, I, 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 I started an electronics club and, mm -hmm. and, you know, got, got um, and um, mm, volunteer to help with uh, uh, taking care of electronic issues at the school, like mm -hmm. it's like simple things, you know. This is just a high school, right? But 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 they still needed PAMs, you know, and so forth, right? So uh, so I ended up uh, doing a lot of uh, what you might call technician type duties, mm -hmm. running around the uh, backstage, um, and so that. Uh, that eventually opened the door for me uh, in my uh, uh, um, uh, when I was in between the junior and senior year in high school. I uh, I had the opportunity to um, at that uh, this is 1967 now, and Fairchild has already set up a fairly large assembly plant in Hong Kong, hmm. and there was a new um, company called Sylvania, which is at that time part of GTE. Uh, also, follow their footsteps to start up a new, uh, also uh, 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 transistor assembly plant. Um, I didn't know anything about that stuff, you know. So uh, I, I have no idea what what company, what all those names mean meant, and uh, um, so I picked the one that was closer to my ho home. So it, it, and I, I started working. At, uh, I worked at Sylvania. Uh, in the summertime, and they needed some help because they were just starting new, and uh, I and uh, they found that I could actually do, you know, uh, uh, maintain their their uh, their curve tracers and all that kind of stuff, you know, do calibration work and so forth, uh, bonders. You know, there was a lot of uh, a lot of calibration stuff going on in these factories because um, uh, the thermal couples constantly need to be uh, to be calibrated. Mm. So you had learned English uh, in school as a British colony. Did they teach English as sort it's of a standard? It's a foreign language. It's, yeah, so it's a second language. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, 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 so I know the, 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 the some grammar and so forth, but it was uh, uh, far from being proficient, as you can imagine. So when you went to work at Sylvania, did they, was that in English or in Chinese? I would say it's 99% in Chinese. Mm -hmm. Th there were only a very small number of uh, uh, expats. Okay. Uh, that they came from uh, from uh, Boston area. Th mm -hmm. That mother plant was in uh, somewhere, mm -hmm. Woburn, I think. Okay. All right. Go ahead. So you were you ended up working at there as a summer job, but then oh, yes. or also during the school year as well. No, just summer job. Uh huh. Um. And then. That's in my senior year. Um, you know, we st I started thinking about uh, uh, what to do afterwards, and uh, I, I kind of like electronics, and it I was pretty good at it. And but you know, uh, University of Hong Kong has very limited uh, mm -hmm. room, <laughs> basically. Uh, so somehow, uh, again, you know, just by random chance, I uh, I, I I learned that. Uh, that about uh, various, quite a few universities in the U.S. and I 
one of them that I applied to actually offered me a scholarship, and that was Ohio University. So that's how I ended up there. And uh, well, they, they also they offer an electrical engineering program. Mm -hmm. um, very naive back then, uh, at that time. Uh, and um, I, I had no clue what, but it turns out that uh, it was a, uh, it, it was a kind of, uh, it, 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 the, the school was uh, offered a lot of um, emphasis on on the um, motors, generators, stuff like that, because mm -hmm. power industry is is, right. is uh, important uh, in that area. It's I found out that uh, in fact there's a lot of strip mining going on. And there's a lot of power plants. Mm -hmm. um, but they also uh, were, or they were starting to move into uh, uh, offering electronic classes in, uh, in transistors-based type of circuitry and so forth. So, and yeah, so it, 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 it worked out to be pretty good. So what was it like? Had you ever left Hong Kong before? And what was it like going off the United States and Ohio? And tell me about that experience. Uh, it, it's a it's a huge cultural shock. <laughs> <laughs> uh, never left Hong Kong even a, <laughs> a step. <laughs> <laughs> Hong Kong is kind of um, you know landlocked, right? Because there, it was w it was it was uh, and you know it, it, it was um, uh, sort of like an island, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, incredibly dense population. Incredibly dense population, and then I, I was kind of like parachuted into a semi-rural uh, uh, environment. Uh, yeah, so so it, it, it was a big shock in every which way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and was that sort of a happy experience? Did you, were you depressed? What, what was, you know, was exciting? What was the no, I, I was very, very happy during the, the college years. Um, uh, so I hit off, hit it off very well with uh, with my uh, uh, teachers, professors, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so mm. they they um, they took care of me pretty well. Is your uh, English had gotten significantly better by this time, or you sort of learned it as you went? Uh? So one of the one of the fortuitous things that happened with me is. Uh, you, you remember I mentioned that I came on a scholarship, mm -hmm. which meant that that uh, I I get to stay in the dorm. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of foreign students uh, uh, find lower cost housing than than the dorms. Uh, they they tend to live together in a, mm -hmm. you know, in apartments and then and then uh, they then talk to each other in their mother tongue again. Mm -hmm. right? So, whereas I was truly parachuted into <laughs> into <laughs> a, a very American. Uh, uh, environment and so I was in the dorms and uh, dorm life was uh, uh, very eye-opening uh, for for one uh, I get to uh, practice this English language or the American flavor of the English <laughs> language 24 <laughs> 7 right so um, uh, so I picked up the American accent if you haven't noticed <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah and and uh, and I, I also got to, uh, um, I think the, the professors kind of uh, took a liking to me and, uh, and they trusted me with a lot of things. So I get to do a lot of things in the, in the WE department fairly early on. Mm -hmm. yeah. They figured out quickly that you were pretty bright. I, 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 I guess. <laughs> 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 so... How did you, how did you started out in electrical engineering and you got a bachelor's? Uh, any significant uh, projects or programs or professors who influenced your direction while there? So looking back, um, I tried to take a lot, uh, I, I took a lot of courses in, uh, in, in, in math and physics in addition to EE. Because um, for me, EE classes were pretty easy because mm -hmm. I, I already had very good uh, understanding but without the math, mm -hmm. right? I knew how about radios and so forth. So, so when I s when I start to connect to the, the the math, and I was I, I, I was able to catch on to like the so a lot of these uh, like for example frequency domain type of concept and so forth came came very quickly to me. Mm -hmm. um, but looking back, uh, s we we had a uh, 
at that time a brand new uh, uh, I IBM System 360 Model 44 computer, which by, by today's standard is, uh, is a very minimal machine. Um, it could <laughs> so, but the important thing was that they it it, it had the Fortran four um, level G I believe uh, uh, compiler, mm -hmm. uh, and that's the only thing that I actually <laughs> got to use because I would never touch that JCL stuff. Right? So <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, uh, the way that b b well, they they did not have the problem of uh, students overusing the computer. <laughs> Most students would not go near there. So I was sort of the, uh, the outlier, right? So, mm. uh, so, so I never hit any bounds on, <laughs> on what I can and cannot do there. <laughs> so I, I would be there a lot. And I, uh, uh, I start to uh, uh, just experiment or play around. It became a big toy, right? So, uh, so, I so you weren't taking classes. It was just your own initiative. And yeah. what kinds of programs were you writing? Uh, whatever that struck my fancy, because I, I, I would just look at some books and look at some, some things that they were doing, and I'd say, hmm, I wonder how they did that, you know, mm -hmm. and I just tried and, 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 and kept. Um, so I ended up, I think, spending a lot of time on, uh, uh, was very beneficial to me later on, uh, because I, I start to um, get a flavor for how stubborn these programs can be and you know how unforgiving and you know all mm -hmm. the, the brute force type of debugging was just punch cards and oh absolutely mm -hmm. <laughs> back then it was just nothing but punch cards yes uh, so in my senior year um, uh, well one, one thing that like uh, was just very uh, nice at uh, Ohio University was that they had a uh, it was one of the center of excellence f uh, that FAA uses to uh, uh, to do some of the avionics uh, development mm. and research. So there was a project going on at the time. Uh, later, uh, well, the C5A was, uh, was already deployed, uh, and instrument lending systems, I, I don't know, ILS and, yeah. uh, and the localizer, they were all um, uh, antennas, uh, 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 arrays and systems uh, that you put on the around the runway. And there was... Uh, the, the frequency range of those uh, uh, systems were such that uh, th if you have large uh, metal surfaces up near there, there was some concern about whether the uh, the antenna uh, profiles or the the the, the uh, yeah the, uh, would be significantly affected, mm -hmm. which would not be good because if you have a plane parked next to the uh, antennas, what happens to the plane th another plane coming right. in? So there was somebody else doing the. Um, uh, doing the, uh, uh, it was a grad student that was doing the, the, the uh, his thesis on the uh, the instrument landing uh, instrument landing system. So one of the professors said, "Hey, uh, since you since I noticed that you s you have all, <laughs> I've logged a lot of time on the computer, right? Apparently, they the professors do notice that, <laughs> <laughs> unbeknownst to me, <laughs> and uh, said, why don't you?" See if you can all extend that and uh, and and get the localizer. And so I, I, I then I had a real uh, bona fide reason to uh, yeah. to do things, which also allow me to have a much bigger account, which means that I can run bigger jobs. So that was very good because uh, then I that was a f my first real experience in, in building some s uh, a piece of code that was useful to that does uh, uh, electromagnetic field solving. So you had to apply your math skills as well as uh, everything else you'd learned. Yeah. It sounds like yeah, that 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 was that was a, a very uh, uh, looking back. That was a very uh, uh, important and fortuitous uh, point in my life. I think. Did you come to any conclusions about the uh, potential impact of the problem you were investigating? Oh uh, yes, uh, and we 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 the the, uh, the the conclusion, of course, was that it the impact is very minimal. Um, and unbeknownst to me <laughs> at the time, I've never, you know, 
I, I, I had very no visibility to the outside world, what's going on. The reason why FAA was uh, so interested in C-5A, which is a military yes. transport and so forth, was that there was a, a, a twin <laughs> version of this thing coming out. You said, oh, I, I, I say it in jest, but, but it's actually made by Boeing called the 747, <laughs> which is amazingly similar profile <laughs> of the uh, C-5A, right? Uh -huh. uh, and, and that was going to be everywhere <laughs> in any uh, any number of, uh, of these uh, uh, large airports, right? So, right? so it was actually a very useful problem <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> to, um, to, to know the answer to. Right. So, so you uh, were there any pr particular professors who you know became sort of your close advisor or helped influence your f direction out on leaving Ohio? Um, actually, I was uh, very close to almost all the professors mm. that I had. It w it's a it's a very small. It's a very small department mm -hmm. compared to s to some of the the programs out out in the out here that I um, I know right so right. it's it's tiny compared to that right. and so we I knew most of the, most of the people very well and it was a very nice uh, cordial environment. So d during your time in Ohio, did you go back to Hong Kong frequently or once no. a year or what was not even <laughs> not even <laughs> once a year? No. Uh, maybe I've been I w went back once during the four year or something. Huh. You, you have to understand, during back then, th we did not have internet, we can't do Facebook. <laughs> 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 um, even long distance calls were prohibitive. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, so and, and at that time, the uh, cost of living uh, uh, discrepancy between the U.S. And, and the rest of the, well, in places like Hong Kong is so large that it's, uh, it's unthinkable hmm. to do a lot of. So did you, uh, you had three other siblings, did they stay in Hong Kong or what? Uh Oh, as it turns out, my uh, they they eventually all all uh, uh, came to the U.S. for uh, college, and today they are all living yeah in uh, in the U.S. <laughs> and eventually, my my parents came over to and, and joined us because you know the, the center of gravity is <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so they came to you rather than you going back to them. <laughs> all right, so you're about to graduate, or you're in your senior year. What were you thinking in terms of your future? Did you think about Going to work immediately? Did you know you wanted to go to graduate school, and how did you end up at Caltech? Well, I wanted to uh, uh, go to graduate school, um, and uh, the professors there all encouraged me to apply. And uh, uh, they had some connections with. Well, some one of the professor got his PhD from Cornell. Um, you know, we have con connections in the, in in the Midwest and that mm -hmm. area, right? So. Uh, so I ended up with a uh, offer to uh, go to, uh, go to places like Cornell and uh, um, and applying to Caltech was a was again a fortuitous but random uh, event. Uh, they yeah. So I, I just happened the only school um, you know to on the west uh, coast that I applied to was Caltech. Uh, and and but I I actually my first choice school was MIT. I mean frankly. Um, However, uh, MIT uh, professor gave me only a provisional, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Acceptance. Uh, they accepted me, but they say, well, you know, we're, 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 can you hold on a bit before we offer you the, uh, the uh, research assistantship? I think that they want, th they, they, they want, they waited for somebody else to turn it down. Right? Yeah. So something right. like that. I, I didn't know. I was just, you know, so, but I was just, Looking at the okay, so they, they all have the same deadlines. You know, it's a f nicely uh, a uniform system. Right. So I say, hey, you know, I have this this offer from 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 Caltech. I called a guy and he said, well, you know, just wait on wait wait, and it, it was off by one week basically, right? But so I said, I have to accept the, the Caltech one, and I went and so I, I did. So I did not go to my first choice school, it, but it's, it turns out I was very happy. Right. That. So had you you had never left Hong Kong before you came to Ohio. Had you ever left Ohio before you went to California? <laughs> I had no clue what, what, I, what I was doing. <laughs> I just walked. You know, nowadays, when, when, when my kids uh, apply to schools, we visit the campus, we talk to the professor, we talk to the admissions, nothing like that. Right. right. Yeah, we, yeah, we, we <laughs> we, the, 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 the best thing that we, I could get was to, uh, to uh, get their catalog and just read it from cover to cover. Right. So I did a lot more reading now. Right. 
So Southern California, another big shock moving from <laughs> from I Ohio, right? I had no idea that that I, that that Pasadena was actually like LA. <laughs> <laughs> And that close to Hollywood, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but it was very exciting. Um, I I I, uh, I got to learn uh, a bunch of things that uh, was com again, you know, very foreign to me. At, uh, from coming from uh, from a school that was still teaching me about uh, AC motors and you know stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, suddenly, I was taking classes in uh, in semiconductor physics, which. Uh, which was very, um, which was rather difficult, be just because of I had no f prior exposure, mm -hmm. so I had to work real hard to get get up to speed. So you had you had not had any semiconductor classes at uh, Ohio, only, only, whatever that's touched on by the electronics circuits classes, mm -hmm. but they always give you a very cartoon version of the what the hose and electrons right. are like, and you know, no so real theory and mathematical uh, basis and so yeah. forth. Yeah, so 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 um, I very quickly found out <laughs> <laughs> found out my depth in the, in <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so it, it was hard work. Um, so that was one, and then s and then the that the year was uh, seventy. Two, you right? entered in seventy two. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, and in at, at Caltech, I um, the thing that affected me uh, my, my 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 time at Caltech the most was that uh, that I bumped into Carver Mead, mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. had just finished teaching a uh, class, which I think it was called EE two eighty one. Uh, that uh, it's like a multi-project wafer type of um, type of um, uh, class. Must have been one of his original VLSI design classes. Yeah, and uh, it was uh, well. He had good personal relationship with uh, people. At at Intel from right. from Gordon Moore on down down, and he had, he had a few former students uh, like uh, Jerry Parker and Ted Jenkins were the two people that I interacted with a bit at that time too, mm -hmm. like, and and they would simply uh, uh, process some of our student project wafers uh, uh, like it was an engineering lot. Mm -hmm. With with the sponsorship of Gordon Moore, you can get a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of can happen. project you go <laughs> go through, right? So, yeah. So, um, so I I did that, and uh, and then you know by by uh, so you bump you sort of bumped into quote unquote bumped into him, and then took his design class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, he seems to take a liking to my my project because that. By uh, just before Christmas time, he said he pulled me into his office and say that hey, you know, pull something out of his bottom drawer and say that this is something that I've been working on. I don't really have time to finish it. So can you take a look at this? Right? So, so it turns out that it was a. Um, so let me think about how to say this. It was um, an analog read-only memory, mm -hmm. but it's a sequentially accessed uh, analog read-only memory. And the only application that I can think of was that uh, we use that to uh, generate the x and y and z uh, vectors, incremental vectors for 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 moving a uh, a um, uh, to generate a cursive character mm -hmm. on a on a on a beam mm -hmm. uh, vector display. Yes, mm -hmm. vector display. Yes. Yeah. Which back then was uh, this is just before the random access memory got real cheap. Yeah. So compared to core memory, this is very good. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, a lot of uh, uh, well, all the radars were built like that, and a lot of uh, high-end graphics were all done like that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Tektronix built a lot of uh, big, big terminals mm -hmm. like that, and I think most of the Kalma. Computer vision yeah. and th those machines were all yeah. done with vector. No, yeah, right, yeah. yeah. So, so I we I actually uh, built the um, the first version was a PMOS, mm -hmm. uh, eight micron, eight micron, I think, yes. Um, and uh, and then I did a improved version on an NMOS in uh, six micron. 
So you did this as one of the projects that was fabbed at Intel? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was able to store all, you know, 32 characters of the, you know, ASCII set. I remember, uh, I remember the first time first time uh, when Carver was talking about these things and uh, he used the word font and I have to stop him and say can you spell that for me <laughs> 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 you know I uh, you know first of all it's a f second foreign language and right. second of all I, I never had the chance to use the word that vocab that word right font mm -hmm. yeah no it's a it was largely unknown to the general population before the world of computers and now, so forth. So now it seems like six-year-old kids would say, right. that's not a good font. <laughs> 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 no, only, uh, only uh, graphics uh, and yeah. typesetting people knew about fonts. So anyway, but, but, uh, but <laughs> <laughs> I. So d was all this d happen during, in pursuit of your master's degree or later in your PhD? So Caltech actually has no uh, thesis or research requirement for master's degree. Mm -hmm. um, so, the, you know, so I, I got, yeah, so I fit, so I guess to answer your question it is for the PhD then. Uh, or so you had, uh, you went there with the goal of getting a PhD. You yeah. never, it was yeah. never an option to just get a master's. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I was also having too much fun. I mean, <laughs> that it was just, 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 uh, just exciting and fun to do. Um, um, and 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 then uh, after I got the chip, that's when the real fun started, <laughs> because we also had to. Uh, I I had to build uh, video amps mm -hmm. and uh, somehow interface them into uh, some kind of a graphic display. And you know, the n none of these things was. Uh, I mean. Well, turns out, yeah, high frequency uh, 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 analog is uh, precision analog. Mm -hmm. High frequency precision analog is uh, uh, not as easy as uh <laughs> <laughs> uh, not as easy as uh, you know just just making it happen, right? So it was a lot of debugging and uh, and uh, and uh, between actually between Carver and and me. Uh, neither one of us had that type of experience, but mm -hmm. he. This is. Um, I think. I think the. Um, I see this in uh, in uh, in the Bay Area too. The, the university professors have a lot of um, relationships with the industry, mm -hmm. especially back in the seventies, and they. Uh, and in in the case of Carver, he just had so many former students. You know, Caltech put out a lot of very smart people, mm -hmm. and. In, in working in the area, um, he would just call up somebody and uh, you know bring him in for uh, and, and uh, to talk to, to give a talk, talk to us, tell uh, tell us about you know they have they are building this aerospace industries all mm -hmm. down in uh, L.A. back then, right? So uh, so these people that their professional job is to do um, microwave radars type of work, so they would say, well, you know, you should think about doing this, try that, you know, that that turns out to be um, Immensely helpful. Uh, it beats learning that stuff from uh, from grinding through math in a right. uh, lecture <laughs> class. <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> so, so you got some help from the professors, but mainly in Carver, but mainly from uh, just outside consultants that came in and yeah, through well through his pro connections. Pro bono consultants, right? Yeah, but yeah. Pro bono, no, just visiting. Just uh, through the his his personal relationship. And right. And, and so. so that's that was. Uh, uh, that was very good, and I, I think uh, I, I start to appreciate the sense of you know a community. That mm -hmm. that, that, uh, that's because of growing up uh, doing electronics, it was always a loner type of a thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I yeah so so you what did you eventually do your thesis on uh, at Caltech? So I th that was contributed to a big chunk of it, and then mm -hmm. I also worked on. Um, um, work on some uh, a um, how should I say uh, let's see uh, a serial multiplier that was that was used for uh, a, a DSP system. Uh, so I w basically moving into the it, it all these things are kind of very very signal processing related right mm -hmm. analog and digital and so forth. So so uh, that's 
Did you end up working significantly with any of the other professors, or was, you, was Carver your thesis advisor, or how did that? So Carver was my thesis advisor. Uh, I, 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 I get a lot of help from, uh, from the, my, my, the, uh, the, the uh, semiconductor physics professors, mm -hmm. uh, because doing, uh, understanding the, the physics of these uh, s seemingly very simple MOS devices uh, turned out to be, to be very crucial in making, uh, making that type of chips work. Bec the reason is because I was Doing the circuit design and... I was using the transistors that was really designed and built for um, digital circuitry. These people have no <coughs> um, no um, no considerations for analog type mm -hmm. of designs, right? So um, we use what we have, and uh, we don't we we just. Make, make make the best of it. So the, the the thing to do is to understand what it is and figure rock it out, rock it mm -hmm. out ourselves. Um, and also, this is before the time of circuit simulation, just a little bit before. Actually, uh, Spice was being developed right about that time, mm -hmm. unbeknownst to me. Again, you know, mm -hmm. this is happening up in Berkeley, right? So. Um, so you're coming to your end of your time at Caltech. What was what were the options that you were looking at, and what kind of job were you seeking as a result? So this is 1975. Uh, I think um, the uh, Vietnam War was coming to an end, and the uh, economy was there was just a lot of uh, uh, not good things happening because mm -hmm. the oil embargo happened uh, mm -hmm. two, two years earlier, like 73. And the semiconductor industry hit a uh, hit a fairly s deep uh, um, recession, so everybody had hiring freeze. <laughs> 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 Lucky me again. But you ended up uh, you ended up going to Intel. That's right. So I, I ended up with uh, job offers from uh, from from HP, uh, TI. Both of them were from the research labs and, and Intel, but Intel was a uh, was a uh, was a uh, uh, microprocessor chip design. Mm -hmm. um, it's a tough choice uh, because the other places I get to do you know single processing, mm -hmm. <laughs> but but Carver said you know these microprocessor stuff might be something there. <laughs> <laughs> Just might be. Might be. <laughs> so it was very, it was, uh, yeah, so. So you went off to uh, Intel. Who was, what group did you get hired into? Who was the manager? What Bill Latin hired me. Okay. Uh, he just joined from, uh, from, from Motorola, actually. He started out, uh, s it was a, it was a uh, 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 high power group. Uh, looking back, you know, Justin Ratner was, uh, was mm. the, uh, was the the, the uh, logic the, or the or the, the the computer architect, I guess. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so, what was the first project, and did you get to apply any of your analog type of skills, or were you thrown into the world of digital and microprocessors? Yeah, so um, I started actually solving problems like um, uh, back then the the microprocessors that was. Hitting the market was uh, 8080, and 8085 was was still in uh, in debugging. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not come out yet. So I joined Intel in uh, yeah about Christmas time 75, uh, basically 76. Um, um, and uh, the question was asked: Can we make a 16-bit uh, ALU fast enough? For what we want to do, mm -hmm. so so I turned it into an animal problem, <laughs> 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 and um, and uh, play, play for the eighty eighty six. This is for the eighty eighty six. So so again, eighty eighty six has not been uh, been been started yet. Mm. Um, so I I was kind of like um, coming up with a solution that found a problem. <laughs> <laughs> 
uh, again, you know, think events looking back, it's it's it, it looks looks very differently from at the time when we were when we were just thinking like, uh, hey, you know, that's a problem that needs to be solved. And uh, and once you had a solution, then suddenly a lot of people say, hey, we can use that. Right? So, <laughs> so and and and. We w I was actually uh, it, uh, building it for Bill Latin's project, which was as many years later to became the 432. I see. Uh, but the 80, so so 8086 sort of uh, 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 was the first 16-bit uh, microprocessor that was. So did you introduced. did you come up with some innovative techniques to speed up the? I mean, did you were you able to apply your analog skills yeah. to speed up the? Yeah. So digital problem. Yeah. So it, it's yeah. So the the carry chain and so forth I was. W w w I I thought of it as a as an analog propagation an mm -hmm. analog signal, right? So, and it turns out it was very. Uh, um, uh, it worked out very well, and I built a lot of test chips to uh, to make sure that that uh, that I was not you know that that it's actually does work. Mm -hmm. So I was. Um, yeah. I, uh, the, uh, in in work work working at Intel, you know everything. I uh, everything is uh, verified and tested. You know, so 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 I get the chance to constantly be doing things and, mm -hmm. and making sure that it works. So what was the so lead me through your time at Intel? What was the next thing that you? Uh well, it's a long time ago, so it's kind of fuzzy. But um, I. Uh, e e uh, I worked on various circuit design problems that that whatever it was that 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 they were throwing at me mm -hmm. um, um, and uh, there was an opportunity to uh, put an, an analog interface into a microcontroller and again it was for an application that that sound seems like a uh, neat thing but Never worked out like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, for example, uh, we we're doing this uh, microcontroller that they were. They thought that right about that time, microwave ovens were starting to come up, and they thought that you know, having a uh, in in the cheap interfaces would be like a pot, uh, and you if you just put an, an analog voltage into this thing, uh, you can do set do a lot of settings, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and if you have an A to D converter. So I built an eight bit A to D converter. Uh, again, this was done on uh, on what's known as uh, HMOS, which is approximately four, somewhere around four micron uh, uh, NMOS, no CMOS, NMOS. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so after that, I I I I I, uh, I thought to myself, you know, if we do a, a few more things. We could probably get a get a ten bit A to D converter out of this. Yeah. So, <coughs> and with ten bit, we have a lot more applications because uh, at the right about that time, uh, Motorola was uh, uh, was supplying a lot of uh, microcontrollers to uh, to electronic engine control. Mm -hmm. So they were up to the third generation already. E C one two three at, 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 at Ford. Uh, so. To make a long story short, we I I I, uh, I built the the A to D converter and uh, and proposed an architecture to work with uh, and work with Ford, <coughs> and we ac actually got the EEC four uh, the uh, business at at Intel. Well, wow, that That's must have been a major breakthrough, a huge yeah. uh, huge win for Intel. And and we thought that wow, this would be the huge volumes, right? Yeah. So, and 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 uh, of course. In, in in reality, things didn't happen back like that because uh, a little, little company like called IBM <laughs> came knocking and wanting to do a thing called PC, right? So that changed Intel's trajectory completely, which right. is for the, uh, for the better, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, and so suddenly, the automotive business looked less important to them. So, so uh, you were at Intel for how long? For six years, seventy approximately yeah. eighty one. Yeah. And sort of any other major things, and how did you end up leaving Intel? What was the well? So um, first, uh, uh, well, Intel was uh, growing fast, mm -hmm. and they knew they had to grow outside of the Silicon Valley. 
well, back then it was not called a Silicon Valley yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, Santa Clara Valley, right? So they, they knew they had to move out. Um, so the Bill Latin took his team up to, uh, to Oregon. Uh, I, did I did not move. Mm -hmm. I, uh, you know, I, uh, th those were the few years that, that I was uh, in the process of getting married. So I just didn't want to move. You know, mm -hmm. stay. Yeah, so for personal reason, I stayed. And then I, so I then reported to uh, Craig Barrett, who, mm. who, um, who was uh, starting uh, his first uh, general management job. So mm -hmm. I reported to him. And his, he also wanted to move that group out to uh, uh, Chandler, in down in Phoenix area. Again, for the same reason, I didn't know. Mm -hmm. So, so we, after a while, I think I, I finally got to figure out that hey, you know, this is <laughs> it's going to be. <laughs> You're going to have to keep turning down jobs, right? <laughs> and they were good jobs. So anyway, so meanwhile, I started. Uh, 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 I uh, we we kept talking to uh, Carver, and mm -hmm. he said, that, "Hey, you know, we we we're onto something. You know, this is a." Uh, they're, they're, they're there is a much bigger problem to be solved because people need these chips designed. Uh, in a, and and if you look at the the the, the, the ways things are scaling, you know it's it's it is the, the old way of doing things on on pencils and mylars is uh, just not not you know won't, won't get us very far. Not sustainable. And. And I agree, mm -hmm. and I think that uh, again, we th I thought that it would be a very tough problem. Um, how do you automate something that's that? Uh, it's f very difficult to do by humans already. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this is 1981. Yeah. But he convinced you that this was worth pursuing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. And he, yeah. So he, he. Along with a few other people, we, we uh, embark on a, on, a, on a project that, in retrospect, looks like it was uh, uh, too ambitious for at that time. Because I think that our, uh, in terms of this, the hardware technology and software technology, it was very difficult to do all the things that we uh, envisaged to. Mm -hmm. Just too, too, too much. Who was the founding team? This is for silicon compilers, right? Yes. Yeah. So uh, Carver um, had um, had me, uh, Dave Johansson, uh, Ron Ayers, uh, who who's passed away since I think, and uh, and John Doerr. Mm -hmm. hmm. So John Doerr was at that time still at Intel, is that right? And no, he has just left Intel to join a uh, VC firm called Kleiner Perkins. Kleiner Perkins, okay. Yeah. So he he provided the financing. Or Kleiner Perkins provided the financing. Yes. And so was John on the board? Did he have a management role? What was his? Yes, he actually took on a, a, a took on this project uh, under his wings, and and he was essentially like a like a, a part time CEO. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Dave and. Ron were both working at Caltech. Did they move to Silicon Valley, or what was? Uh, how did this all come together? Uh, no, they didn't. So it was uh, it was you know a tale of two cities. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little difficult, yeah. Um, but you know, what was your role in the early days of silicon compilers? Um, so. Um, I started with uh, with um, essentially like a like a um, uh, engineering row f of uh, that that it, uh, that involved both software and hardware, um, but but uh, very quickly I uh, I start to focus more on the, the on on the actual chips you know the silicon side of things. Um, mm -hmm. Out of necessity, I think, because I think that that I was the I was the person that had the uh, had the knowledge and experience in that area, um, and um, um, so we, we be because of 
the fact that I, I, I was still living up here and, and, and some of the other guys were down there. Uh, down in Pasadena. Pasadena. Yeah. Uh, w w this is long before the, well, ARPANET was around, but it was, mm -hmm. uh, it was still a very, um, very early days for, 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 for that. And, and we were outside of the ARPANET. But I, uh, it was a big motivation for me to f work out a lot of the, 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 the networking communications and, and so forth between the, the two sites. And I, I actually, uh, I think I, 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 I was one of the earlier people in the, in, in, in the business that had actually email addresses and so mm -hmm. forth for, for the company. And yeah, so I it motivated me to, to, uh, to uh, understand that stuff and, and, you know, and, and get into it. So how did the, sort of briefly, how did the company evolve? What was its focus? And I guess Phil Kaufman later became CEO, right? Right. And how and when did that happen? And uh, uh, just I take us through the evolution I, I, of the company. Uh, okay. So the first year, we, um, so we were trying to do something that was very uh, ambitious, like I said. Uh, we want to automate uh, a lot of things, and, and um, so we thought that it would be good for us to do some uh, uh, feasibility demonstration and, and build something with, with such a system. So I went and uh, built something that that people would would take notice of it, and which was uh, uh, at that time. Uh, it, it's the Ethernet data link controller chip, mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, at the time it, 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 we knew that uh, that stuff is coming up. Um, actually, I, I also uh, if if I'm if I'm not mistaken, you were at Xerox Park at the time. Mm -hmm. Right, I was there from seventy two to nineteen eighty, oh. and then I went to VLSI Technology. Also, the encouragement and guidance of Carver Mead. Okay. <laughs> So but so I was at Park when the Ethernet was developed, and I think Bob Metcalf spun off to form 3Com, 3Com, right, right in '81 or something like that. Right. So um, I was ex a little exposed to to uh, you know, uh, I think maybe maybe Dick Dick Lyon was in uh, at, at Park also. Right? Yes, Dick Lyon was there, and so he and Lynn Conway and Carver and I and a few others working close together. Is Carver had come up and taught his VLSI design class in 1976. And then subsequently, we designed some chips. And subsequently, in 78, 79, he and Lynn collaborated on the development of the right. book. So in parallel with the time that you were at Intel. Right. So, so I, um, um, I went off and, uh, and, uh, and, and built the, the Ethernet data link mm -hmm. uh, chip. Uh, it was just a controller chip, and uh, um, now did you do that using the tools that were being developed by Dave and Ron, or, or did you yeah. sort of a combination of old technique and new technique? Um, I think looking back, the 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 the, the way that I uh, to to characterize it was that I. I put it together and I told them, you, your software needs to do this, to automate this. Essentially, that's kind of, uh, you, you, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so. so were you doing layout? How did you, how did you actually create the layouts? Um, yeah, I did some layouts. Um, uh, but uh, some of it was, I, I did very, m Simple things because we, we, uh, most of the things, most of the uh, the circuitry was uh, just piecing these simple things together. Right. Okay. Mm. So you developed the chip and and you were able to fab it. Where did you get it fabbed? Mm. So at the time, uh, John Doerr also had funded a company called. Uh, uh, called uh, Seek S E E Q. Oh yeah, yeah, and so they uh, they were they were set up to do uh, uh, E square prompts. Mm -hmm. um, 
but somehow he convinced them to build a build a you know uh, a non e square version. <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> and if, yeah. Yeah. And uh, so th uh, this is long before you know commercial um, uh, foundry was uh, yes. was available, right? right. So, so, um, so you developed you developed this chip. The chip worked, or did you have to? I go think so. Seek actually uh, sold that product for 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 yeah. like years actually. And did you collect royalties or something yes, on we it? We collected or? some royalties. Yeah. Okay. And then how did how did the rest how did the story at Silicon Compilers evolve? And um, after that, we uh, went in the. Uh, We, I think, the next big project that we were in, in, in engaged in was uh, to do a, 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 a version of the VAX architecture, the MicroVAX. Uh, MicroVAX, they already, they already, uh, Hudson, uh, Massachusetts, already has a uh, MicroVAX chipset uh, uh, ongoing, but we we were doing a uh, uh, essentially a, a, a uh, another version. Right? So I think we, so. I, I don't exactly know which w right. was the, the nomenclature, but but it was it w we we went and we actually did build one, built the uh, microvax uh, chip for them, um, and uh, that was a big help because because that actually uh, uh, updated our machine uh, uh, computer hardware by a lot because mm -hmm. we were using some old PDP tens and so forth, right? And so we suddenly we had Vax seven eighty. And, uh, and ultimately, our our product was shipped on w on Vax seven fifties. And so you developed this chip. Did that chip was it operational the first time? What was your? Do you remember any? Yeah, that was fab by by Hudson. Mm -hmm. So that um, uh, and uh, we worked together with a design team. In, in digital has a design team. Uh, I think they were. The people we worked with were at, up, up in the Seattle, mm -hmm. in Bellevue. So I, I, I was the main interaction with them as well, and we together we made, made the chip happen. So when did it, uh, you know, when did Phil Kaufman join the company? Do you remember? Um, maybe '82. He was a uh, uh, one uh, one of the business unit uh, general manager at Intel at the be before that. And what was the, you know, at what point did you realize that maybe Silicon Compilers was a little too early for its time, or, you know, how did the, how did that uh, evolve, and I guess it originally, eventually was bought by Mentor, is that correct? Yes, Mentor Graphics uh, bought, the, the, and before that we also merged with SDL, uh, uh -huh. and then, and then the, the combined company uh, became uh, acquired by uh, was acquired by uh, Mental Graphics mm -hmm. in '89, I think. I would say. So, how was that? Uh, you know, how was that overall experience? What did you learn from the Silicon Compilers experience? Uh, how did it turn out relative to your expectations? Okay, so I I, I would say we focused um, uh, mostly on the physical side of things. Putting you know putting the circuitry together, uh, we focus much less on the um, the front end design. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you describe the hardware? And so and and as it turns out later on, uh, VHDL was uh, proposed by uh, DOD, and and then uh, Verilog became ultimately be becomes the the lingua franca of today, right? right in in uh, hardware description. Um, so that's uh, a, a, um, a, a a missing piece. Uh, we we sh uh, and on the we also uh, we actually worked very <laughs> the our our um, design system contains uh, uh, timing analysis in addition to uh, to a logic simulation. Which was uh, very early for for that type of technology at that mm -hmm. time. Um, so and uh, so we did a few things right. Um, 
But looking back, I would say the each of these areas that we, we uh, work very hard to do eventually turn out to be a very large, uh, uh, large, uh, how should I say, uh, a large product mm -hmm. area. Like timing uh, is, is a, a big product. Uh, whole companies timing. did just timing, right? <laughs> and whole companies just did very well, for example. Right. Um, and it was, uh, looking back, <laughs> We, we were spread very thin like peanut butter, right? So mm -hmm. it's, it's difficult to, um, to, mm, to, um, to compete favorably uh, uh, in, in that environment, I would say. Before the merger with SDL, what was the size of the company? How, did, how large did Silk Compilers Inc. become? Do you remember? Well, in, in terms of, uh, well, I don't know how you measure. Uh, well, just in terms of employees or, you know, just get some measure of the size of the operation. It, it was something like maybe 50, 60 people. Okay. So, um, do you know what eventually drove the merger with SDL? What was the... Well, I think both sides felt that we were um, under critical mass, mm -hmm. and um, in terms of philosophy, it's also a little, little uh, uh, quite compatible. We both were, were doing, trying to do um, um, design automation. Mm -hmm. You know, looking around at that time, other companies that, uh, for example, ECAT was just doing DRC. Mm -hmm. uh, the DMV side, you know, the Daisy Mental Valid were, were just doing layouts. Uh, mm -hmm. Whether it is, um, they were mostly doing um, uh, logic schematic capture. Mm -hmm. um, we, not, no, nobody had the, nobody even was thinking about to, to, to really automate, the mm -hmm. right? Um, and, uh, uh, the the word synthesis is not even in our lexicon at that time. Right. Um, so it's different times. <laughs> right. A lot. Uh, yeah. So. So eventually, what finally drove the acquisition by Mentor? How did that come to be? Um, Mentor uh, uh, wanted to uh, move into uh, the IC space. And um, and I think that that's their, that we we fit their that part of their vision to move mm -hmm. you know and uh, mm, but well but mentor had its uh, had was 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 having some some product launch struggles at the time which uh, I didn't know that until later on their, fa their famous version eight problem right yeah, <laughs> yeah. and. Uh, uh, again, also uh, uh, a, a um, uh, yeah, they 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 just they just reach a little bit f further than they they should, right? So right. it's difficult. Um, it, it, but this is this is um, sort of the nature of uh, of our high tech uh, uh, industry that you 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 need to constantly be challenging yourself to uh, to do ambitious things. Only history can judge whether you were just about right or, or too too ambitious or not enough. Ambitious right. So, <laughs> so, but you have to sort of uh, pay your money and take your chances. <laughs> so you uh, you went with the acquisition. You stayed at Mentor Graphics for a few years after yes. the company was acquired. Yes, and and so I um, I uh, basically f uh, focused on the on a, on a. Um, Mixed signal, mixed analog, digital, and, and uh, 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 simulation and, and analysis, and uh, we had uh, some some clientele in that area. So some big customers. while at Mentor, yeah, we, well, using the silicon compiler technology. Yes, yes, uh -huh. Yeah, so so uh, I continue to uh, to push that and and, uh, and uh, uh, def keep. Uh, uh, developing the product line and mm -hmm. so forth. And by this time, the 
was all the operation in Silicon Valley, or was there is there anything left in Pasadena, or did that? Oh no, that went away a long yeah, time yeah, ago. A long time ago. Okay. So uh, you continued on with Mentor for how long? Three or four years? Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And then, then what happened? How did what what was the next step in your career, and how did that come to be? So I um, joined up with a few other people uh, uh, to uh, do a company called Anagram, mm -hmm. and uh, at that time, um, circuit simulation has become a, a one of these. You know, a, again, you know, a point two becomes a, a, a big company now. Uh, uh, I think H is uh, was quite successful. P Spice is also not, not bad, and mm -hmm. there's, there's quite a few uh, products out there. So um, we started a new uh, area that, which I think I call fast buys. Yeah. And uh, and um, there were some uh, attempts at, at doing uh, uh, relaxation and other other approaches there, and there were not any um, widely used uh, productized type of uh, sof uh, uh, software out there. So we thought that it would be good for us to do something. Whose idea was that? Who was the motivating factor and say, hey, let's form a company? Um, how did you get involved? So I would say um, there's a professor up in the in, uh, uh, University of Washington, mm -hmm. Seattle. Uh, his name is uh, Andrew Yang. And uh, he, has a, he and a few of his uh, uh, PhD students were already you know, uh, uh, moving in that direction. And how did they find you or become get you involved? I again just random events. You know, I I uh, met up with them over, over, over some kind of a some kind of a, a research gathering. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and uh, seemed like a good thing to do. And 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 we got kind of lucky at the time because we did find some applications that uh, that grew very fast at the time. So what? Who was the? Who furnished the money for Anagram? Um, we did not actually uh, go out for VC funding. So, you know, we, we it was basically self-funded. And uh, what was your role in the company? Um, I, I was the CEO, okay. president CEO. Yeah. So that was your first CEO experience. Yeah, that's, that's right. Mm, did you feel you were fully prepared at that point? Did you? Uh, how did you feel moving into that role? Were you comfortable? Was it different or harder or surprising with than you f than you expected? Um, It was not easy. It was hard. Yeah, <laughs> and and uh, um, I also had to travel a lot. Uh, at the time, the um, the uh, a big part of our business was coming from uh, both Japan and uh, Korea mm -hmm. and, and Taiwan too. So it th th those were the years when uh, when the industry was was. Well, Japan was in uh, Japan was very strong, mm -hmm. and Taiwan was coming up rapidly. And what so year was it? What years? Uh, was I would say ninety four to ninety six that time frame. Ninety three to ninety six time frame. Mm -hmm. yeah. And ninety seven or something like that. I forgot. How you know was the product successful? You know, did it realize the goals that you set out? And then what became of the company? Um, I think it was quite successful by by our uh, uh, by by our criteria, mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, and eventually uh, Avanti acquired us in somewhere between ninety six and ninety seven. Mm -hmm. And uh, does that product continue in some form yes. at this point? Yes. What yes. So that uh, that got absorbed into uh, into Avanti. And uh, Avanti eventually got acquired by uh, Synopsys later on. And does this product still live in some form in Synopsys? Yeah, actually, uh, I, I think FastSpice is still a, a fairly important product line for. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so there were uh, 
uh, if you trace the genealogy of today's fast spice, there is many, you know, it comes from several different routes. And, uh, but, but what we did was still, still quite useful. What was, you know, I presume from the name that this was, th its major advantage was that it was a lot faster than the traditional spice. Right. And can you explain just very briefly what the source of that speed advantage was and what compromise in terms of accuracy or whatever that, if any, that took place as a result? So we basically looked at the, um, by then it was all CMOS. So we looked at CMOS uh, circuitry and say, hey, um, for a circuit simulator, there's um, what type of, uh, uh, you know, where are the spots where the, where the, uh, the circuit simulator spends a lot of time on and how can we um, speed them up? So it was very s targeted uh, uh, engineering on, on software engineering if you like, on, on, f on uh, speeding things up. But, but it also involved the doing things differently. For example, the, the nature or the way that we, the, the uh, computer, uh, the transistor models were, were, were calculated um, required a lot of, you know, a lot of time. And so is there a better way to do these things? Mm -hmm. and knowing, you know, basically what, what regime you are in and for the transistor, can we, can we make uh, much better, um, uh, much faster calculations without compromising much accuracy? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really a piece of engineering work, basically. Mm -hmm. Right. So it wasn't fancy mathematical ar ar algorithms. It was just looking at just doing a good job of engineering and figuring out where the problems were and where the holdups were and how to optimize those. Mm -hmm. But I think we made sure that the mathematics was sound. Mm -hmm. But it was not a mathematics-driven uh, thing, right. not like the FM. And so, th and the accuracy was essentially the same as uh, more traditional spice algorithms. Um, so we, w you, you know, uh, when when we introduce a product like that, customers has ready-made evaluation vehicles, right? They mm -hmm. already have uh, uh, sim uh, s circuits and so, uh, results from uh, right. from. Spice, so, so yeah, they they th they throw us in <laughs> into the lines then every time, right? So yeah, so that's. And what kind of performance improvement did you see with the fast spice? I mean, what was that? depending on on s some sometimes we see several x, sometimes we see tens of x. Hmm. Uh, depends on yeah. So it was enough for yeah. people to uh, pay, take uh, take note. Right. So Avanti acquired the company. Did you then? Become part of Avanti, or what was the next step in your career? No, I was uh, I, I was with uh, Avanti very short time, and, mm -hmm. I, I, and then and then I uh, departed. Yeah, because yeah, it's typically what happens. <laughs> you acquired a CEO. A CEO, and what was the next step in your career? What? Uh, how did you? Um, so, uh, I had a. Uh, I set out for a year because some some contractual requirements, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and then uh, and then uh, Synopsys was looking for somebody to uh, they they acquired an also a, a, a s another uh, kind of a rival uh, uh, fast spice company called Epic, mm -hmm. and uh, so they they were looking for somebody to uh, to head it up and. And I, I joined Synopsys. Uh, I believe it was in '78 or so. Mm -hmm. To you, know, ninety. No, I mean '98. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. So then to you end up staying at Synopsys for quite a long period of time. How yeah. long? Until about 2006, I think. Mm -hmm. And were there sort of major any major developments? Things uh, was it. It was an engineering management positions that you held, or what was the? Yeah. What do you feel the most important contributions or events during your synopsis career were? Um, so um, we went through a uh, a a. a the Avanti acquisition in mm -hmm. the early 2000s, and 
uh, we so we brought in a, some a bunch of products that affected the the my area at the time. Were there some of your ex employees still with? Uh, yeah, there were. There were actually there was. So. Um, So the, the, the acquisition was, uh, was a v very big event. Um, so you had to combine the anagram operation or what was left there with the uh, epic operation and yeah. sort out the issues there and so yeah. forth. Yeah. Um, so you stayed in Synopsis till 2006? Yeah. So, I, I, and, and, and I think uh, somewhere along the, the, that time, I, I also moved over into a, into a take on a marketing role. Hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and then the, the operation also um, changed and morphed into something, because by then we also were bringing in like a lot of DFM type of uh, product lines. It, there was a lot of growth by acquisition during that period. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so Synopsys eventually became the leading company in EDA during yes. that time, or? Uh, I think, uh, yes, I would say so. Uh, uh, and you may recall that Cadence was uh, uh, having some, some stumbles about that time, too. Right. So. so what would you attribute Synopsys' success? You know, it's been a very long time player, growth through acquisition as many EDA companies have, mm -hmm. um, but they've managed to kind of keep moving forward without any major setbacks. Is there any observations you would have having been within the company for six or eight years as to what management style or approach or whatever account helped account for that success? Um, I think um, Art is a very effective CEO. I think he's uh, um, uh, yeah, and 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 also Chifun is uh, is also a very um, very effective. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess now the Chifun is the co-CEO, mm -hmm. and the two of them work very well as a team. Um, and they uh, the the it's it's it's. I think you know this the. the the leadership sets the tone, right? And mm -hmm. so, in terms of how um, how the standard for at which business is to be done, they they, they set a very high standard mm -hmm. um, and uh, very known, very they are very open and uh, very no nonsense. Yeah, so, he, he, I think he they they it's um, there there is reason why their top management's been so stable. It's they they there was. They, they did a very good job. They're very effective. I was at Cadence for a few years myself, and I would say, you know, Cadence had a very uh, outwardly focused, very heavily focused on sales and marketing, and um, I always perceived that Synopsys was more of an engineering company, that at its heart it was an engineering company. The leaders were engineers. and. Is that a fair assessment? Uh, do you think that you know was internally was it you know was engineering sort of held up to be the the core of the company and or is that n not an accurate observation? So first of all, I think it's accurate. Uh, all the most, if not all, the top management are are, are, are technical people. Mm -hmm. Um, but make no mistakes, they are very business focused. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they also uh, pay very close attention to uh, the customers' needs and, and what the customers are doing. And, and, and so sales and marketing is also a very important discipline there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they um, um, it's, I think they, they, they have found a very good balance actually, mm -hmm. yeah, I would say. So, come 2006, time to move on again. <laughs> Serial entrepreneur. <laughs> what, uh, tell me about that and. Uh, okay, so this is uh, my actually my current project. Um, 
So we're doing uh, uh, w something that's uh, not not even uh, in the in the electrical engineering uh, discipline proper. Uh, this is more like a mechanical engineering issue, right? So it's a, 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 a thermal analysis. Uh, but but the main issue here is that the power densities for these modern electronics is getting very high. Mm -hmm. uh, so high that uh, that you can have very very steep uh, temp uh, slopes on the on, on if you look at the temperature profiles, which means that you can have. Um, is this a gradient over the chip? Right. Yeah. Within inside. Uh, if you just look, so you at have very hot spots, and then yeah, and and this this the the, the gradient of the slopes is directly proportional to the power density, right? So, mm -hmm. so, um, so we can develop very f sh narrow peaks. Look, looks they look they could look like needles actually mm -hmm. uh, on the, on the profile uh, pictures. Um, so you may have reasonable average temperature, but but quite onerous. Uh, uh, Quite quite um, ominous type of uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, spot temperatures, and as you know, all it takes is one bad thing, and you know, your chip is toast. <laughs> Literally, in this Literally, case. Yes. <laughs> uh, so this is this is 2006 when you decided to move to this company. Yeah. Tell me about that. How did you find it, or it find you? Why did you decide that that was the time to make a change? Uh, I, I, you know, it, 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 I actually at while at uh, while at Synopsis, I uh, one of the, the several responsibilities I had was uh, also uh, uh, related to uh, to uh, the gate level power analysis tools as as well as the uh, uh, the power compiler. Mm -hmm. Back in the early days, when uh, when we couldn't even give those tools away, right? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, back in the early two thousands, uh, people. Design engineers did not want to pay attention to that and didn't care. Didn't care. So, um, but we could see the, the wave coming, and, mm -hmm. and 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 at that time, Intel was already showing pictures of uh, of the power densities, like uh, 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 kitchen stove cooktops to uh, to the rocket nozzles and uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> nuclear nuclear reactor core and and. The Surface of the sun, <laughs> <laughs> they were all like orders of magnitude, right? So, so we're we're on on track to, uh <laughs> 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 yeah. So, um, the, and uh, yeah, it, they they they've been preaching it for many years, and and they caused Intel, uh, the whole industry, to change direction to um, go to into multi-core instead of uh, cranking up the clock rate. So, and uh, there's a lot of actions that was taken to mitigate the problem, right? And still, it is a problem. And so, to in 2006, d what had somebody else sort of identified a tool or a company, or was this your idea, or how did this all come no, to? No, this company's been been been, been formed. Uh, they have, uh, they, they, it was already uh, uh, in in operation at that time. So they asked you to join as CEO. Yeah. And did you think that this was something that was? An immediate problem? Uh, did you? What's your experience again in terms of the solution versus the demand, and especially in re, you know regard to timing? Um, well, I think that it's also it, it, it's like many things I, I I've done in my life. This this it's it, it is uh, uh, ahead of its time, mm -hmm. and so the demand has uh, is is still catching up. I think we have uh, we have we have the technology to do these things, and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so so I what we're doing is essentially in a missionary kind of a uh, 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 marketing uh, project to 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 show people that hey you know if you have this type of problems or or this if if your your designs fit this type of a profile you should. This will benefit you. And is the um, impact of these um, very hot spots, if you will, or temperature gradients, uh, it does it actually lead to poor operation or out of spec operation, or does it actually destroy the physical chip? What what is the consequence, and what 
how do you, what, what's the evidence that you have this problem if you've got an operating chip? Okay, so let's start with the more uh, ominous ones. That, that how, how it destroys the chip usually is because uh, of some sort of a wear out mechanism. And everybody knows about electro migration. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and actually, the, uh, the, the semiconductor devices uh, suffer from, uh, from, from high temperature as well, especially around the oxides. Um, there's more, there, there's a quite a bit of uh, um, both uh, negative bias and positive bias uh, 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 at high temperature makes the device essentially uh, drift into a, a, you know, out of spec potentially. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a, uh, there, there's, there's a lot of concerns f in that area. Um, but for f the things that, that attracts the uh, uh, attention of design engineers are that, uh, that some temperature variations both in space and in time, actually impacts the, the circuit operation. Mm -hmm. So for analog circuits, you know, uh, match components, you know, this is very easy to understand. What's a little less uh, obvious is, uh, is uh, for example, we, we, we know of an issue for, um, for these um, mobile uh, 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 RF power amps where uh, because of their, uh, uh, because of the, the, the modulation, the, the, the how you modulate the, the RF signal to get, get your, uh, 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 your, your, your carrier is, has uh, sidebands mm -hmm. and, 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 and the, 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 the interaction causes the, the, uh, 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 the power to, to vary at a, at a at a rate that's uh, about the same time constants as your thermal time constants. Mm -hmm. And so the device actually, uh, you know, uh, they've noticed that on the, on the up, up part of the signal, the, 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 the behavior is different from the down. And, and the, the, up the, the net effect of it is that it, it stresses their, their uh, adjacent channel, uh, you know, how much um, power they're allowed to leak into their adjacent channel. And as you know, these, they're pack also pack trying to pack a lot of uh, channels into, into the spectrum for, mm -hmm. because so many people use self cell phones and such. You know? right. And so all these things are uh, contributing to, um, to a, a design you know, issue that they, they need to address. And, and, and we, we happen to be a, 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 uh, a solution for them that they can uh, you know, show them what the issues are and uh, help them uh, mitigate them. So, while they're in the design process. Yes. Yeah. So, are there any? Uh, so, you you indicated that sometimes people don't immediately understand the depth or breadth of this problem. So, perhaps you've uh, or can you tell any anecdotes or stories about companies that have ended up with this problem that you know caused a major issue or company crisis that you were able to come in and solve, or are all such stories still proprietary? <laughs> it, 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 is a, it is difficult. Uh, the reason is because I don't think that any of our, our customers would like publicity drawn to uh, <laughs> them having a you know, wear out or IE reliability issue. <laughs> <laughs> so, no. Um, <laughs> however, um, can you say that there are, based on your knowledge, there are chips out there that do have a reliability or wear out issue that? Just, just think about the, the trends, right? In the last decade, we've made the, uh, the uh, metal lines narrower and thinner. So the cross-sectional area is smaller <laughs> and smaller. And so, and we wrap them in uh, low-K dielectric. The low K meaning uh, porosity mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, means holes. It's kind of like uh, uh, wrap them in a blanket, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, and then you we we, we put uh, currents through them uh, the, that are switching pretty fast. I mean, you know, s w I think the clock rate has uh, has stabilized now, mm -hmm. but it's still fast enough. Like th we're still in the gigahertz, mm -hmm. so um, so uh, if. If you just look at the the, the um, amount of currents going through them, uh, 
So are these mainly even for signal lines. These are just for signal lines, which is uh, right. Um, so these are mainly wiring wear out issues, metal yes. migration or whatever. As yes. what about actual device uh, transistor device failure? Is that also possible? And yes. Um, so it's good that we recycle our products, uh, consumer products, every couple of years. And <laughs> yes, I, 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 I know. I mean, just just looking at a, a lot of people seems to uh, replace the cell cell phone as quickly as their battery dies out. Right? So, <laughs> so in that case, then then yeah. But 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 it's y so the expected lifetime. You know, uh, when I started my career. Uh, uh, Telephones were made to last 25 years. Right. So, so we're certainly living in a different world. So, however, our our, however the wear mechanisms today are much faster too. So, right. you basically, it's a, it's a. If you, if I was a designer, I would do, to balance this against the uh, the warranty requirements, basically. <laughs> <laughs> now, an area where there maybe are longer lifetimes expected in military projects. So, are those? particularly important customers for you, perhaps, that have long-term life requirements? C certainly, um, for certainly a lot of the, the for example, the, uh, the RF and microwave uh, uh, um, applications are in, you know, in, in, in mill aero related areas. Mm -hmm. So, uh, how big is your company now? This is Gradient Design Automation? Yeah, we're, we're still very small. We're still operating like a startup. Yeah. How many people? We're small, just around under 10. Under 10, I see. And is it, uh, has it been venture funded or what? Yes, it's venture funded. Who, who are the investors or investor? Um, so, the lead investor is Alloy Ventures uh -huh. and, uh, and uh, Lancer Tech Ventures also. Mm -hmm. Is Lucio Lanza on your board? Or yes, uh -huh. yes. So what's your vision, you know, is this, uh, how long do you think this company stays in this mode? When do you expect it to grow to a, you know, is there, does it reach sort of a knee and grow bigger? Or what's the, what's your vision as to the timing of this now? Um, it, that's hard to say, it's very, Difficult to predict the future. <laughs> um, however, you know we, we're working on uh, on with customers on uh, uh, addressing issues uh, with respect to uh, these FinFET devices that are. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they are these 14 nanometer devices are uh, are very strong in terms of uh, what you know uh, 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 as a switch performance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they can also put out a lot of, uh, you know, a, a, a do a lot of things in a very small volume. <laughs> Good opportunities for you. <laughs> yeah, and and that those devices are also all wrapped around in uh, in uh, in uh, thermally challenged materials mm -hmm. because they 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 tend to be floating in, uh, in oxides and oxides all the way around. So it, yeah, so all those are uh, are are. Our uh, our uh, growth areas. Mm -hmm. So let's just look forward. You're you know right in the midst of you know some of the leading edge problems with the leading edge semiconductors. What's your view of roadblocks and opportunities for continued migration in terms of semiconductor evolution? Uh, is power the major problem at this point? Uh, w just tell me sort of what your view of semiconductor technology is over the next five or ten years uh, in terms of what the major roadblocks are and um, so from the designer perspective I think um, even if you don't call it a problem per se power is a major design consideration mm -hmm. it's definitely not a um, not a don't care anymore mm -hmm. so you, you know you you, you they uh, the reason why they are not a problem is because some th of the diligence of some design engineers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's let me put it that way, right? So they, they it is something that that requires a lot of attention and care and feeding to make sure that 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 they they, they everything stays well. Um, I think from uh, from from 
you, you asked about the, the um, from a, a EDA software perspective, uh, you know, the, the number of leading edge customers are getting to be fewer and fewer. Mm -hmm. Because there's just not that many people, uh, not that many companies that, that can of that is uh, investing at these uh, 14 nanometer <laughs> FinFET devices, uh, uh, these the future generations, right? Um, so our uh, and and our I as long as we are still uh, measuring our revenue opportunities by how many you know how many uh, copies of software we license and so mm -hmm. forth, that 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 w that is a. a um, what did I call power? A constraint. That's mm -hmm. a business constraint for us, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so it, it, it's a, it, it's some, s yeah. So all these things are uh, are are are, are uh, uh, we 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 need to innovate around some many of these things because I think at the end, I think EDA is a key. If not contributor, uh, if uh, it's definitely a contributor, I would, I would uh, 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 personally, I would even call it an enabler to uh, to mm -hmm. all these electronic developments. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we all know that it's been that 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 development curve has been spectacular. Mm -hmm. uh, call it Moore's law, if you will, call it whatever, right? So, but it's it, we had an incredible run in uh, in our career time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and um, it's it it it's a uh, it the the uh, the the business uh, is such that you know a couple just recent current event. I know that this will go into history, but so later on it may not make so much sense. But just within the last month, news business news had uh, had Facebook acquiring a company. That most of us have not heard of <laughs> WhatsApp. <laughs> WhatsApp for, for some something like just Six south 16, just 16 or 19 billion yeah, dollars, just south of 20 billion dollars, right? right. Think, which is uh, a, a sum that's larger than our whole industry put together. Yes, in terms of uh, market value, market cap, and valuations, and so it's kind of a uh, makes you wonder. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> some food for soul searching. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, so. so what do you? Uh, you know, as you said, you and I have shared a spectacular run. We were both uh, sort of born in about the time the transistor was born and have yeah. been able to ride that curve from sort of very large devices to spectacularly small devices and yes. everything that's come with that. Uh, how long uh, is that, is Moore's law coming to an end? Is it going to be limited by physics, power, money, Need you know what's what do you see as sort of the evolution of semiconductor technology over the next five or ten years or as far as you can see it? What do you is it EDA? Is it power? Is it you know what's what's the? So first of all, I think that that uh, it will definitely end. Mm -hmm. The the reason is uh, is uh, a nanometer is ten angstroms, <laughs> and angstrom is the atomic dimension basically, and so we, we we're not going to. Um, uh, people are talking about quantum uh, gates and mm -hmm. switches and so forth. Okay, got it. <laughs> um, there's a, a lot more work needs to be done to uh, to figure out how to get in and out of that with those uh, those logic sta states, right? Know, right. So um, and so, okay, fine. W w maybe we'll we'll get there someday. Maybe not 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 in our career for sure. Mm -hmm. But okay. However, they they. There is still a finite point. You know, you're not going to get. S I doubt that we'll get smaller than that. Okay, mm -hmm. so and maybe we don't need to, um, because I think, we s y as you mentioned, the the uh, financial uh, barrier to uh, to it, it's. I think Moore's law ultimately, uh, Gordon Moore himself would would explain that it's ultimately an economic uh, uh, impetus. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's a better way to say it than law. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, you 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 do that, and you you'll be more cost effective, and and then you win. Right. And if you don't, somebody else does that, you lose. Right. <laughs> right. So it's very simple. 
but when, when, when if the, the next node is so expensive, prohibitively expensive, that, that the, it no longer provides the economic impetus, then the party sort of... Uh, Party's over. Whoops out, right? So, <laughs> yes. Um, um, so uh, but, but then it becomes less of a production and economic driven issue and more of a research driven issue, right? Research and right. development. So that, that would be much more like how, how say, uh, uh, how high tech, how technology is generally done. Right. Um, but I would say that today, uh, uh, just, I I'll make two comments. One of them is that, hey, you know, uh, for a while, uh, uh, every every generation of airplane got bigger, faster, and whatever. And then suddenly, it it said we're good enough, and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, stay stay pretty much like that. And then it make improvements, incremental improvements on in other dimensions, mm -hmm. and uh, you can produce a very healthy industry like that. Mm -hmm. it's not. Uh, it's not not feed uh, not feeding off of an exponential curve in, in in necessarily, but what's wrong with that, right? So, right. so so let's just 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 leave that uh, uh, alone as a mm -hmm. philosophical point. Um, and but if you look at what we are already capable of doing, how we can apply the technology, we don't have to just keep ma making making. Uh, computers, server boxes, or or, or, or or smartphone boxes, right? There are so many things that we can apply to uh, in uh, in medical field, mm -hmm. especially. I think the the uh, ability to miniaturize and uh, and or just use the access to uh, the, the the data processing and data storage, and uh, you know the, the uh, and. Uh, is so beneficial to so many so many fields that right. uh, that will have a very positive impact to our quality of life. All right. Well, that was actually sort of what I wanted to conclude with is sort of where you thought that the uh, the next exciting developments were and where things might evolve. And so, it sounds like the uh, focus on making much better and broader use of this technology, which is which we're really just scratching the surface of is uh, is high on your list. Yeah. So th just the uh, what your feedback and thoughts on use of this technology as we move forward. Yeah. So um, if I may quickly recap uh, the last uh, several decades when I um, when I experience was that was that there was a um, very symbiotic uh, growth or development between um, the computer industry and uh, and the software tool industries that I w that I participated in and uh, let me explain so in every generation we use the best hardware available and we were stretched a little bit because we were always uh, we were a leading edge uh, software. Technical software is specifically an EDA software. Yes, mm -hmm. is a e EDA software is technical software, and mm -hmm. we, we are insatiable in when it comes to you know computer resources, mm -hmm. both in space and and, 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 and performance, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and you know what? Every generation, every couple of years, uh, Moore's law is ticking on on for 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 the uh, computer makers too. And, and as well as the disk uh, makers, mm -hmm. and you know oh, that whole industry is is uh, floated up by this uh, general improvement in technology, and just in time for us to uh, <laughs> uh, go to the next gen. So, in in order to design the next generation of uh, 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 chips, we either whether it's going into the disk drive or the or the servers or whatever, um, it requires so much more resource. So it was a very symbiotic and and positively feedback system that kept going up and up mm -hmm. higher and higher. Um, so in a way, it's kind of a uh, we're we're very inward looking, and that's th the biggest opportunities in terms of uh, software licensing sales and so forth is is to sell to other people just like us, you know, mm -hmm. engineers doing do in the in the uh, in guys like Intel, AMD, you know, mm -hmm. people that we all know and so forth, right? So, mm -hmm. however, 
if we just take some of the branching and go into neighboring areas like uh, chem chemical and, uh, uh, and, and medical fields, so on and so forth, mm -hmm. there's so many other areas that can that can seriously benefit from uh, from the availability of this compute power, mm -hmm. storage uh, technology, and uh, and and communications access uh, uh, networking uh, capabilities. It I, I just I think that it's uh, the the opportunity for us to uh, better understanding the world uh, that we live in, and also make it a better place for us to live in, is so so just just very very uh, encouraging. Well, great. I think that is a great uh, point on which to conclude. And so, thank you very much for spending the time with us, Ed. And uh, congratulations on a fascinating and successful career. Well, thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to uh, speaking to you. Thank you.